I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Prayer is not something we do. It is something that is done through us. Just as we can turn on our radios and access different stations, so we can attune ourselves to the conversation which at all times takes place in the depths of our hearts. It is the loving conversation between the three persons of the Blessed Trinity who have taken up their abode in us since our baptism. <coughs> Do not let your heart be troubled, Jesus tells us. Believe in God and believe in me. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. In that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Anyone who loves me, my Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. You will recognize St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, but do we take it seriously enough? Prayer is not something we have to do, something we have to invent, something we have to articulate in a multitude of words. Prayer is a sound of sheer silence which we hear and to which we accustom our hearts because it is the language of the Trinity as they whisper their love to one another in the depths of our hearts. We don't have to do anything or say anything. We only have to turn off all other noises and descend into the mind shaft of our still bodies, our quietened minds. These are the initial problems of prayer. How do I calm my body? How do I turn off my mind? Some people use the digital anesthetic of the rosary. Others are trained in age-old techniques such as in the Buddhist tradition. John Main learnt his secret in India. He taught from then on the trusty formula of the mantra. But everyone to their own favorite tube station. It doesn't really matter which entry point you use as long as it leads you to the underground. Nor does it matter how you avoid the bushwhacking thugs or the armed robbers in the mind and the body, always lurking in the shadows to waylay the pilgrim climbing down into the depths of the heart. Where did the poet learn to settle his mind on one thing? Ted Hughes asks himself. It is a valuable thing to be able to do. 
but it is something you are never taught at school and not many people do it naturally. <clears throat> I am not very good at it, he says, but I did acquire some skill in it. Not, <clears throat> not in school, but while I was fishing, I fished in still water with a float. As you know, all such a fisherman does is stare at his float for hours on end. I have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours staring at a float, a dot of red or yellow, the size of a lentil 10 yards away. Those of you who have never done it might think it a very drowsy pastime. It is anything but that. All the little nagging impulses that are normally distracting your mind dissolve. They have to dissolve if you are to go on fishing. Once they have dissolved, you enter one of the orders of bliss. Your whole being <coughs> rests lightly on your float, but not drowsily. Very alert so that the least twitch of the float arrives like an electric shock. And you are not only watching the float, you are aware in a horizonless and slightly mesmerized way, like listening to the double bass in orchestral music of the fish below there in the dark. At every moment, your imagination is alarming itself with the size of the thing slowly leaving the weeds and approaching your bait. Or with the world of beauties down there, suspended in total ignorance of you. And the whole purpose of this concentrated excitement in this area and arena of apprehension is to bring up some lovely solid thing like living metal from a world where nothing exists but those inevitable facts which raise life out of nothing and return it to nothing. That is what John Main provided us with, a simple but colorful float. We hang it up inside our minds and gaze at it relentlessly until its hypnotic power anesthetizes our minds like the swinging fog watch of an expert magician. And then we can escape from the grasp of the cyclops and lower ourselves into the magic cave of the heart where we taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, while the dark about our loves is strewn, light of my dark, blood of my heart, O come, and night will catch her breath up and be dumb. Leave thy father, leave thy mother, and thy brother. Leave the black tents of thy tribe apart. Am I not thy father, 
and thy brother, and thy mother, and thou, what needest with thy tribe's black tents, who hast the red pavilion of my heart. <laughs> 